want to welcome uh, Diane Shader Smith. We many of you know Diane uh, as a writer, uh, cystic fibrosis advocate, and and know her the story of her daughter Mallory, um, who was diagnosed with uh, cystic fibrosis uh, from a very young age, and um, from I, I think early you know preteens nine ten she kept a diary until she was twenty five, um, recounting her. Her illness, her her friendships, her family, her relationships, and and also her her commitment to talking about her experience. And so uh, many of us heard Diane present uh, masterfully at the California Coalition for Compassionate Cares conference. And so here she is joining us again. And we're so grateful to have her. Um, Salt in my soul, uh, an unfinished life. This is the compilation of Mallory Smith's diary entries. And so these were edited by Diane and were published posthumously. There's also a documentary that accompanies this book. And um, we're so grateful to Diane. Diane is, is on, a, uh, on a world tour um, and has been very busy uh, promoting, speaking, advocating um, for cystic fibrosis and a variety of, of, of therapies, some of which she's gonna talk about uh, today. And um, I just uh, wanna welcome her and just uh, so grateful for all that you're doing and for the time uh, today in, in your very busy schedule. So I'm going to talk for about 35 minutes. I have close to 200 slides for anybody who hasn't seen the way I work. And so I'm going to hide myself because I really want you to focus on the slides. And it's meant to be a very experiential thing where you see and hear the story as opposed to looking at me, which you see me. That's all I got. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, And I'm doing this from a hotel room in DC, having just been this morning, the keynote at a very big conference. And I am very, what's the word? Um, sort of tech challenged. I'm, now I got the chat right in the middle of my, hold on. I literally have the, the, the I have to fix this. There it is. I have to close the chat room because there was some interesting stuff in there. So hopefully you'll save it and we can look later. But I'm I'm doing this on two computers, and so I'm not as comfortable as usual. But um, I'm going to give it a go and hope for the best. So, okay. So everybody, these oh, what happened? Are you are you seeing yeah. my screen? Mm -hmm. Okay, salt in my soul. So these yeah. days, these days, every industry seems to be touting the benefits of store of storytelling. Here we go. It's going to take me a bit. But it's really important to note that no other industry can compete with narrative when it comes to emotion, drama, heartbreak, or miracle. The medical world is ripe for the stories. There's so much that can be learned from the voices and experiences of people living with and dying from disease, more so than from the details of any particular disease. These experiences are as diverse as they are misunderstood. We need patients to share their stories, to reveal clues that can inform treatment decisions, improve communication, break down diagnosis denial. But doctors, nurses, palliative care workers are under so much pressure to spend less time with patients and more time with electronic medical records that patient voices are often ignored. To address this, the New England Journal of Medicine just this past year Publish the power of the patient voice. How can you treat a disease if you don't know about the body carrying it, about the life within that body, the person he, she, they? Allowing patients to share their life experience breaks down barriers and offers other benefits as well. Their stories can inspire innovation, compel action, challenge assumption, humanize healthcare. My daughter, Mallory, thought so. She understood that amplifying patient voices could have implications for society. So she spent 10 years documenting what it was like to straddle the sick and the well worlds, to live with invisible and visible illness, to be colonized by bacteria that was a known killer. Lyrics from Hamilton resonate. Why do you write like you're running out of time? In hindsight, it's clear Mallory understood her prognosis. Diagnosed with cystic fibrosis at the age of three, she had to do daily treatments. It was terrifying. 
but the doctor seemed hopeful when he said that the lifespan for kids with CF had increased from five to 25 and that they expected it to get even longer. But all Mark and I heard was that our child had an expiration date. I was bawling my eyes out. So I asked the doctor how he dealt with hysterical parents and very sick children. His perspective helped me. He said he treated kids who had been beaten, burned, or abandoned. He saw the love we had for Mallory and the smile on her face, and he promised us she would have a happy life. Mallory had lots of symptoms, a persistent cough, a chronic runny nose, and serious GI problems. I was desperate for a way to explain the disease to Mallory and her brother Micah, but there was no children's book on the shelf back then about CF, so I wrote one. Mallory's 65 Roses. 65 Roses is what kids hear when adults say cystic fibrosis. We read the book to Mallory's class every September, gave a copy to her friends, and even the boys when she started dating because it provided an easy way to explain her illness, which for so long was invisible. This book taught Mallory the power of narrative and inspired her to become an avid reader. Mallory was always compliant with her treatments until one day when she was nine, she came home from school and she refused to do them. So for the first time we introduced the idea that CF could be fatal and explained it's why she had to do treatment. Mallory listened very carefully and then ran out of the room crying. She didn't speak to us for three days, but after that, she never missed a treatment. And she started writing, this was her journal. It was a wonderful outlet. During the years, Mallory's medical teams became a huge part of our lives. They would often ask if med students and residents could come to her room for bedside training. Mallory always said yes. She was always engaged. They called her the poster child for compliance and all the healthcare providers loved her, but they didn't always love me. I was the bad cop to Mallory's good cop. My job was to protect her even when it made me unpopular. There were so many things I did that got me into trouble. I was known to block the door to Mallory's hospital room before 6 a.m. when they wanted to empty her trash, write her daily goals on the board, or drop off medications when she had been up until well after midnight doing any kind of a treatment because a nurse had a coding patient, the pharmacy was backed up, or there was a late night admit. Sleep does not seem to be valued in the hospital, so I fought for it. I used to sneak Mallory out of the hospital to get her hair washed, even though protocol dictates you can't leave. It was important to keep her mentally as well as physically healthy. I used to sneak her beloved dog Kona in at night because pet therapy is great medicine. Another issue that caused problems was the inconsistency between days and nights. During the day shift, there are layers of staff. Management is watching. At night, it feels like a ghost town. With no system of checks and balances, more mistakes seemed to happen. That was Mark's experience. He would sleep bedside when I needed a break and complain all too often about problems that came up at night when there was no one to address them. Mallory writes, it isn't the big groundbreaking health events or even the scariest set of test results that make life with chronic illness difficult. It's the petty frustrations and humiliations that overtax my patience and goodwill and leave me drained and weakened. Mallory was always reluctant to make waves, so I would intervene. My advocacy led to many fights with the hospital staff. Sadly, I learned from Mallory's journal that when Mark and I fought with the team, it was traumatic for her, which absolutely makes sense because when the two most important support systems a patient relies on are at odds, it creates stress for the patient. When Mallory was 12, she was colonized by Burkholderia sinosepatia a superbug. Doctors said things would get way more difficult. To set the tone for Mallory's life, I adopted a mantra, no pity party. Mallory adopted her own, live happy. We had the same goal, to find joy in every day, even though we chose different words to express the sentiment. Family was always important to Mallory. She and her brother Micah were very close. In high school, Mallory had lots of friends. She was a straight A student and three sport varsity athlete. Second half of senior year, Mallory got very sick and was admitted through pediatrics. It was so cheerful with large photos of furry animals adorning the walls. 
But about 10 days in, they said that they needed the bed for a young pediatric patient and they moved Mallory to the adult floor. Gone was the cheerful decor replaced by stark white walls with no playful pictures. It was an abrupt change and a foreshadowing of what adult care would be like. That admission was long, marked by raging fevers and a bad bout with sepsis. A social worker saw distress in Mallory's eyes and introduced her to the idea of a worry box, a place to put your grief and fear. The theory is writing down your worries and putting them in a box allows you to let go. You open the box when you wanna sit with those feelings and you close it when you wanna move forward. For Mallory, sitting with her feelings propelled her to write, I'm in the ICU wing of the medical center. As the days wear on, I'm no longer able to walk without help and find myself panicking as I grow more oxygen dependent, experiencing pain with breathing. But outside of the hospital, life goes on. My swim team friends are at the peak of training intensity. Graduation speaker auditions are being held. Prom is coming. And I'm super bummed because I won't be able to find a date while I'm stuck in here. I asked her coach pictured here to see if he could help. Coach Rob Bowie said, I'm on it. When I told Mallory that Dylan, a boy she had a crush on, was going to come to the hospital to visit, she could not imagine how that was happening. Of this funny, awkward encounter, Mallory writes, this afternoon, I'm sitting in my hospital room alone and Dylan walks in with flowers. I have no idea how my mom and the nurses work this out. I'm not really sure I do wanna know. But the unusual promposal motivated Mallory to work hard to get her strength back. She was desperate to get out of the hospital in time for prom. Her hard work paid off. Mallory was so happy. To her surprise, she was voted prom queen. After languishing in a hospital bed for so many weeks on end, Mallory was grateful to be out with friends. And it was an incredible evening until the after party. Someone threw a smoke bomb into the venue. Mallory's throat started to burn. Her lungs were searing. Her eyes and her nose were watering. And then hemoptysis when the airways bleed. Mallory writes of this experience, each time I cough up blood, I wonder if this will be the time. The time when the blood spilling up my lungs and out my mouth will burst forth so fast that I can't breathe. The time my hemoptysis isn't just a scare, but the final swift deadly bullet. Terrifying hospitalizations like this had distilled for Mallory a profound understanding of how precarious her life was, how lucky she was to be alive. In her journal, she quotes Chilean poet Pablo Neruda. The translation of this quote, I have to remember everything, collect the wisps, the threads of untidy happenings. She also decided to audition for graduation speaker and she was picked. In her speech, she quotes the universally respected English philosopher, Winnie the Pooh. I used to believe in forever, but forever was too good to be true. Mallory chose these words carefully to be relevant to her classmates, but the second private meaning was inspired by what she refers to as the dark voices in my head, the brokers of hopelessness. Those voices stayed with Mallory in the summer after high school. She was living at the beach because the magical combination of sun and salt helps thin mucus but she was deeply stressed because for the first time she had to think about when and how to tell her new college community about her invisible illness. Mallory's perennial smile belied her anguish. She writes, I'm living a double life right now, the life of someone with a serious illness and serious complications, but also the life of a student, a friend, an athlete. Mallory arrived at Stanford in the fall of 2010, still struggling about how much to share. But fortunately, dorm living has a way of establishing immediate intimacy and word spread quickly, relieving Mallory of the burden of disclosure. Still, it was a difficult decision because after growing up with the helicopter mom, Mallory desperately wanted to be independent. But at the same time, she knew that having my help made things easier. Mallory had to learn how to juggle academic, social, and medical responsibilities to fit everything in. Over time, she adjusted, studied hard, went to football games, and played club volleyball, despite many dozens of hospitalizations. In total, 
there would be 67, with admissions ranging from weeks to months. In her junior year, Mallory worked as a peer health educator in a freshman dorm. She was responsible for the social and emotional health of the residents, but she would often joke that the job description should include sexual health because as the dorm sanctioned provider of condom, that's what students came to her for. In fact, this job was important for so many reasons. During a writing exercise with her residents, Mallory saw a pattern that the freshmen were stressed and didn't feel they deserved to be there. Mallory was able to re reassure them she had felt the same way. And she writes about the duck syndrome. When students are like ducks gliding on the water, what no one sees is that underneath, they are paddling furiously. The stress of working to make things seem effortless creates a vicious cycle of silence and struggle. This applies to physical and mental health issues that so many of us experience. Mallory had both. To manage her anxiety, Mallory spent time in nature whenever possible. She cared deeply about the environment. And in her senior thesis, she compares the degradation of her lungs by the colonization of a superbug to the degradation of native Hawaii by the colonization of foreigners. Mallory recorded the piece as a podcast called Biome and it was played on NPR. The analogy Mallory draws helped her process what was happening to her body. It was terrifying. Of these fears, Mallory writes, my memory, nearly photographic at times, serves me well in school, but it curses me at night. My internal hallucinations are so haunting, I can't escape them. Even when I close my eyes, because the images play on the back of my eyelids as if projected on a movie screen. It's scary to think I might look back and realize I could have done amazing things, but I didn't because fear held me back. Fear protects us from dangerous things. Unwarranted fear prevents us from reaching our full potential. It's been crushing to learn that Mallory suffered so much. Her emotional pain was never addressed until I pushed for a psych consult. Doctors were so focused on her survival that they missed the signs of mental distress. Despite her demons, Mallory did reach her potential and graduated from Stanford Phi Beta Kappa, so excited to do field research. But sadly, the doctors said no to every single project she asked about because exposure to environmental toxins would further damage her lungs. She was devastated. No one understood her distress because Mallory still looked so healthy that people thought she was the golden girl who had it all. She would have traded everything for the chance to take a breath that didn't hurt, to have a life that wasn't defined by illness. As Mallory's body deteriorated, she sharpened her mind, crystallized her thinking, and honed her writing skills, creating poetry at a prosaic experience. Mallory writes, I am limited in what I can do, but not in what I can say. Cystic fibrosis does a lot of taking, of dreams, of time, of travel, of friendships, of freedom, of potential, of plans, of lives. It does not discriminate. It's a complex, unpredictable, irreversible, progressive, painful, suffocating, choking weed of a disease but you can't allow yourself to be unhappy or negative. Negative feelings hurt creativity. The very same creativity that will help you reinvent your possibilities and achieve your goals. Mallory fought hard to reinvent her possibilities without giving up on her dream of working in environmental education. Instead of doing field work, she got hired to write a book, The Gottlieb Native Garden, a California love story. Mallory was offered another book contract but working independently was lonely. So Mallory interviewed for a writing job. The company made her an offer, but when she disclosed her medical condition, they withdrew it. Soon after her infection reignited, landing her back in the hospital. This was for a long stretch of time. While her friends were dealing with normal post-college questions, Mallory was dealing with IVs, ICUs, and indignities, like having doctors and nurses ask about her bowel habits in front of her friends, even when she repeatedly asked them not to. It was humiliating. Mallory was also in excruciating pain, three different times, three different hospitals. 
the opioid epidemic has left the medical community working to regain control over prescribing patterns. As a result, well-meaning doctors would routinely under-prescribe pain meds to Mallory out of their fears of creating another addict. Mallory writes, I feel like I'm drowning from lack of oxygen, but when I ask for pain meds, they treat me like I'm a drug seeker. Despite Mallory's distress at inadequate pain management, at another point, she writes about her own fears of getting addicted. I never thought I would say this, but I have loved to come, I have come to love the feeling of being on opioids. They were never part of my treatment, but as my chest pain became unbearable, I needed them to breathe. They also helped with my mood. With morphine and oxy, there is no pain. There is no sadness. Chronic illness wreaked havoc on her life in other ways too. One time when she was set to have a third date with a guy, a lung function test led to a hospital admission. Mallory was so upset at having to cancel. I suggested, why not invite him to the hospital? Let's see if he can handle her situation. When he said yes, she freaked out because her hair was greasy. So one very special nurse came to the rescue, washed her hair, gave her a pedicure and a facial and ran to the drugstore to get Mallory mascara. They had a wonderful time, even though he wasn't her person. The following New Year's Eve, Mallory met Jack, who I call her real life Prince Charming. She made the decision to disclose details about her disease. It's a good thing she did because a few days later, Mallory was back in the hospital. The antibiotics had stopped working and the only option left was transplant. Tragically, no center wanted to take on her complicated case. So we decided to stop treatment and take a trip to Hawaii. If she was going to die, I wanted her to be near the ocean, which was her happy place. For six magical days, Mallory was IV and free and oxygen in the stayed in the condo. She got to surf, swim, and paddleboard. But on day seven, the fever started and shot up to 103.5. Mallory was admitted to the Maui hospital, but they didn't know anything about Sapatia or have any of the medication she needed. We asked her brother Micah to fly to Oahu. He did and returned with 60 pounds of IV balls. Our plan was to stay put until Mallory was stable to fly. But then the national news announced the worst hurricane in decades was headed straight for Maui. And so we scrambled to get one of the last planes out before they closed the airport. It was in the midst of this utter chaos that we got a call from UPMC saying that Mallory was approved for evaluation. She was all smiles despite her high fever. I was absolutely ecstatic, but the transplant coordinator said not to get excited, that she'd seen way too many people get approved for evaluation, but then be denied coverage. I said, that's not gonna happen. My husband's a lawyer and he has fought every denial. And I'm a publicist. I'll be on the Today Show exposing their refusal to pay. But Mallory was denied. Getting insurance approval for an out-of-state, out-of-network hospital was the single most excruciating non-medical challenge we faced. The battle raged for weeks. They employed multiple stall tactics that Mallory felt were intended to run out the clock on her life. It would take a miracle to turn no into yes. We got the miracle because we knew someone who knew someone. Skewed social and economic policies and care practices made things way easier for Mallory than for many others. Mallory did not want to accept the evaluation because she felt guilty that others hadn't been as lucky. I urged her to use her privilege her access and the power of the pen to expose this injustice. She documents the entire battle and writes that insurance company are inflicting needless additional suffering on patients who are already in distress. It is outrageous and incomprehensible. In early October of 2016, I missed a slide. In early October of 2016, Mallory and I flew to Pittsburgh for a grueling week, meeting various teams that had to weigh in on her case. 
we were on pins and needles waiting to hear from transplant. They said they would call on Monday or Tuesday, but they didn't. We were highly anxious. They actually called on Wednesday, which was Mallory's 24th birthday, to say that they were accepting her as a candidate for transplant, but that at 40% lung function, she was just too healthy to fly across the country and wait. We were so happy to have more time. But in a twist of fate, one week later, Mallory got the flu in mono. And then UPMC said she might not be able to be transplanted after all. She was just too sick. There is this crazy fine line between being too sick and not sick enough. Mallory stayed in the hospital for most of November, December, and January until she was finally stable to fly. The call came on a Monday with instructions to be in clinic on Friday, so Mallory had to fly on Thursday, which gave us two days to pack up our lives for the cross-country move and say goodbye to everyone knowing she might not make it back. This is the day we left for Pittsburgh. Mallory's hugging her brother on the left, and there were, oh, so many tears. But Mallory was happy and hopeful when we arrived. To a patient with end-stage lung disease, the most important call you'll ever get is the one letting you know lungs are available. Once you're listed, you can't exercise, shower, watch a movie, or sleep through the night without your phone right there with you, which intensifies the experience, but you cannot miss a single call. As the days and the weeks pass, your heightened vigilance gives way to hope of hopelessness. Every day, a struggle to breathe, a struggle to stay hopeful. Someone suggested palliative care. Mallory was skeptical. She writes, I needed help, but I thought palliative care was only for old people or dying patients with no other treatment options. Then a social worker friend came to visit. The dark voices in my head, those old familiar brokers of hopelessness, met their match in Danielle. Never selling unwanted or optimism, she validated my fears and offered perspective. We discussed advanced care planning and my end of life preferences. She introduced me to the idea of palliative care as one of the rounding services. She also introduced me to voicing my choices, a tool to help terminal patients express what is important to them in case they become, um, become unable to speak. Mallory was starting to worry that she might end up in the ICU clinging to, to life, which inspired her to write her wishes, her words. If that happens, I want to be as comfortable as possible through opioids or anti-anxiety meds, but not be so out of it that I'm unconscious unless the pain is severe enough to necessitate that. I want to maintain dignity to whatever extent possible to receive whatever life-saving tactic is appropriate, to maintain my ability to communicate in some way, to have the blinds open for natural light, to have calming music to listen to. Listen to. I want to live. To keep her spirits up, I changed my mantra. Somewhere over the rainbow, there are lungs. And I would sing that to her every day until the call for lungs finally came. We packed, raced to the hospital and waited 24 hours. In the morning, the surgeon came in to tell us that the lungs were viable, but they were going to another patient. Mallory was quite disappointed. In total, there were three false alarms. We call them dry runs when you're called to the hospital and prepped for transplant, but the lungs aren't viable or they go to someone else. Mallory describes in vivid detail the ticking time bomb and her unraveling nerves. Months later, the fourth call was a goal, a go. Despite her fears, Mallory was so excited. She was wheeled in for a nine hour surgery and received the gift of life, new lungs. The recovery was grueling, but one month later, Mallory was celebrating her 25th birthday without supplemental oxygen. It was the happiest time as we dared to dream about a new life. Tragically, just a few weeks later, Mallory was readmitted with pneumonia and doctors started preparing me for the worst. They wanted me to tell Mallory that she wasn't going to make it. We said no. Mallory was terrified of dying. We did not want her to be afraid. The doctors disagreed with this choice, 
creating another point of contention. But we needed Mallory to have hope. In these last days of Mallory's life, Mark was working around the clock to get an experimental treatment for her, phage therapy, a promising treatment that was all but abandoned when penicillin was discovered. Penicillin could get patent protection while phages, naturally occurring organisms, could not. Stephanie Strathy, an epidemiologist, sent out this worldwide tweet calling for help and many labs responded. Meanwhile, at the doctor's urging, our closest friends and family gathered. Because Mallory was on a ventilator, she scribbled this note, which reads, can't talk at all, but so grateful you are all here for the hardest part. Herculean efforts enabled the United States Navy to find a phage match for Mallory's isolate of Cepatia. Dr. John DeCuna from UPMC came up with an elaborate plan to send their organ retrieval plane and then a helicopter to get it from the Navy's lab to the airport and then to the hospital. We were so happy and hopeful when those phages arrived. They're in the white box. That night, Mallory made history and became the first patient with cystic fibrosis to receive phage therapy. But the very next morning, doctors advised us to make the gut-wrenching decision to remove life support. Mallory had been without oxygen for too long. The autopsy showed that the phages had started to work. Mallory just didn't get them in time. Mark couldn't save his daughter, but he was certain phage therapy could save others. So he shared Mallory's story with the media, introduced the idea of using phages for kids with CF to the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation, and raised money to make the inaugural grant to IPATH, which is leading the first ever NIH funded trial using phage therapy for CF patients. Meanwhile, Mark went dipping for phages in a storage treatment plant, while I worked with Random House to have Mallory's writings published posthumously as salt in my soul. The playful writings of a teenager juxtaposed with the somber insights of a young woman facing death are why the book has been so well received. One example, an NPR writer says of Mallory's journal writing that she uses extraordinary imagery to describe a life that burned out before its time and to convey in very, very poetic language exactly what the suffering is, but also what the glory of the life through that suffering is able to be. In Salt in My Soul, Mallory describes her treatments and hospital stays, the love and unexpected community she found as an inpatient, the strong relationships she developed with her care team, and the problems imposed by the medical system she had grown to depend upon. Mallory's writing highlights specific areas in patient care. One example, the power every single caregiver has to make daily decisions that affects a patient's quality of life. Doctors, nurses, RTs, PTs, pharmacists, case managers, home health <laughs> nurse. It's a long list. Despite the serious subject matter, Salt in My Soul is at its core, a snapshot of a coming of age, an intimate portrait of a young woman living her life, a life that despite its complications was filled with love and laughter. Since I sat bedside with Mallory, for 67 hospitalizations, most of what I read in the journal wasn't a surprise. What was shocking was that Mallory's facade of perfection masked a darker truth that she had not been able to share publicly. That was her choice. She lived happy, but in her journal, she expresses anger at her disease, shame about her body and its failings, and her determination to live fully while dying. Salt in My Soul, the book, led to Salt in My Soul, the documentary. With this, Mallory gave me a platform to share her insights. She's the reason I'm always touting the need for patient stories. I'm inspired every day by something she wrote. I'm working very hard to see beauty in a life that looks quite different from the one I wanted and expected. As the mom of a beautiful law, a daughter gone too soon. I am working very hard to see beauty in a life that looks quite different from the one I wanted and expected. If we don't share stories, so much about a patient's experience is left unsaid, 
with lessons unlearned and healing not fully realized. When medicine and literature intersect, everyone benefits. Thank you.